So we're going to get started again. Um, we're going to modify the agenda a little bit. If you see there, we we're going to have a website demo talk, showing all the items on the website that we talked about to this point. But since we're running a little behind, I'm going to push that back a little bit, and we're going to get right into uh, Mark Stilson's uh, presentation about applications change and the approval criteria, what we talked about a little bit before, and we'll hit that website demo a little later today, um, hopefully get caught back up. But So if you're following along, we're going on to, to his, and then soon after his presentation will be lunch. So. Yes, this is always the most dangerous spot for a speaker because I realize I'm the only thing that stands between you and lunch. So <laughs> we'll try to keep this moving along. Justin, if you can keep us on track and make sure we get out on time. Um, I'm Mark Stilson. I'm the Southeastern Utah Regional Engineer. Our area covers Carbon County, Emory County, Grand and San Juan counties. And we deal with issues in the Colorado, Colorado River Basin primarily. Um, just real quickly, by a show of hand, by a show of hands, how many of is this is your first time? Maybe consider yourself a novice with water rights. Okay, very good. How many have actually submitted an application to the division and have gone through the process? Okay, a few more. And then, how many are working on their official water buffalo designation for their specific drainage? I know a couple bureau guys back here. We're working on that. Um, we're going to make we're going to give you enough knowledge in these trainings to make you a little dangerous. Alexander Pope in 1709, in his essay on criticisms, said, and I thought that was pretty appropriate because he's talking about water. He says a little a little learning is a dangerous thing. Drink deep or taste not the Pyrian spring. Their shallow draughts intoxicate the brain and drinking lar largely sobers us again. So if you learn nothing else from your training over the next couple of days, you'll learn this is a comp complex process. And rightly so, water is the most valuable resource that we have in the state. And it's, as Nathan mentioned, it's owned by the citizens of the state and, and you're learning about uh, obtaining a right to use that resource. I looked actually for a couple of jokes on how dry engineers are, but then I realized we're all water engineers, so none of those would really apply. There we go. <laughs> so we're going to talk about applications, approval criteria, and hearings. You're learning about the application process. You've got enough courage up now. You've submitted your application to the division. What happens? How do you get it through? How do you get an approval? The, the type of applications that the approval criteria deals with are applications to appropriate. That's new applications that come into our division. Change applications. So you have an existing water right and you want to make some change to that right. Temporary applications, good up to a maximum of one year. New and change applications. And then fixed time applications, which are still temporary in nature, but can go out maybe 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And then exchange applications, which are a specific type of change application. So we're dealing with the front end of the application process. And the criteria. We're looking for evidence of why we can or should approve this application. The standard by which we operate is the reason to believe standard. This is outlined in a court case in 2006. So if you look at um, legal standards of evidence, you've heard of beyond a reasonable doubt or clear and convincing evidence. We're actually at the lowest end. All we need is a reason to believe. Make a good argument. Show that your application is reasonable, has a reasonable chance of success, and you've met the bar. So it places a fairly low burden on the applicant when they're seeking approval for their app applications. So the code, 
the approval criteria is found in Utah Code Section 73-3-8. It shall be the duty of the state engineer to approve an application if there is reason to believe, and this is the first approval criteria, that there is unappropriated water in the proposed source. So you've come in, you've decided what source you want to try to appropriate from, whether that's an underground well or a spring or a stream. The first thing we need to look at is how many water rights have already been filed on that source? Is there still water available to allocate, to appropriate? There was a court case in 1910. What do we mean by unappropriated water in the pr proposed source? On a lot of drainages in the state, we have water rights that have been filed, perhaps in excess of what Mother Nature typically gives on that particular stream. Uh, the courts have defined that until the actual appropriation of water is made for a beneficial purpose, no valid appropriation has been effected. So we look at, and sometimes we're, we're faced with this decision is, okay, is there water in this source available for appropriation? On paper, it may not seem that there is water available to appropriate. Like for instance, the Colorado River Basin, you hear a lot in the news that the Colorado River Basin is over appropriated. Well, in fact, in Utah, that may be the case in, on the paper side of things. We may have enough appropriations out there that have been approved that would show that we're over-appropriated, but in actual practice, we're not using all of our Colorado compact allocation. We can use up to about 1.4 million acre feet out of the Colorado River Basin in Utah. And we're currently using only about just over a million acre, acre feet. So when we look at this standard, is there unappropriated water in the source? We look at, look at it in practical terms. Has the water actually been taken from the system and put to some beneficial use? Feel free to ask questions as we go along. We'll try to address them as we go. Here's an example from our region. This is the Price River Basin. And you can see the area shaded in green. The Price River flows from clear up by Schofield, Soldier Summit, all the way down to the, all the, way down to the Green River and it empties into the green. The area above Price, Schofield area, is fully appropriated. We have water rights that have been filed in excess of what Mother Nature typically provides. And we have essentially restricted that headwaters area so that no new appropriations can take place. We have a policy that, that says if you're in the headwaters, say you're up in Schofield, and you need water for your cabin. You can't file a new application to appropriate because all of that water is already in use. Somebody's got a water right and a claim for it and they're putting it to use. So that part of the Price River drainage is fully appropriated on paper and in practice. Every drop is spoken for and being used. So the only way to affect an application would be to find an existing right and do a change, which happens quite frequently. Uh, folks will build a cabin in Schofield and they'll acquire a share in an irrigation company and move that share up to uh, service their cabin. Below price, from price on down to the Green River, it's not fully appropriated. So if you had a need to come in and say you're doing a road project down by Woodside and you wanted to take some water out of the Price River for construction purposes, you could come in and file a new application with us. 
a new temporary application or a new permanent application. And we'd say, yeah, if there's water back in the stream below price, it's available for appropriation. So you can see that even on just one drainage on one stream, you may have the instance of part of it could be fully appropriated and part of it could still be open for new appropriations. So again, how you figure all this out is go specifically to the area you're looking at, pull up the specific policies in that area. It will describe if where you're looking is appropriated and closed or if it's still open to appropriations. That's on the Green River. We create spreadsheets and we show the various water rights that um, have been affected in that area. The Green River in Utah that flows through our area, the perfected rights total over 100,000 acre feet and 934 cubic feet per second of flow. Well, the Green River on average flows um, over 4 million acre feet and, and so there's still water available in, in the Green River. Let me back up. This is actually on the Price River. I'm telling you wrong. This is on the Price River. We have 932 cubic feet per second appropriated and over 100,000 acre feet. The average flow of the Price River is 300 CFS and 57,000 acre feet. So on any given year, not all of the rights in Price River are delivered. Okay, the next item or criteria is the proposed use will not impair existing rights or interfere with the more beneficial use of the water. This is where it gets kind of down to the nitty gritty. You can see the two water users there having a polite argument of, over who gets to use the water. Yes, yep. So this is when you're, you come in and file an application and your neighbor downstream says, no, this is going to affect me. So we look at those issues. Are you going to impair existing rights or interfere with the more beneficial use of water? Uh, the next item would be um, and we're going to take a little bit of a sidebar here and talk about temporary change applications. Clark mentioned that ap applications are typically advertised. For temporary change applications, uh, a recent law was passed and, and said, State Engineer, we want you to act on these a little bit quicker. And so we're generally familiar enough with certain areas that we can say, okay, this area, we, we know what's going on and we can make a decision very quickly whether or not we feel like somebody's going to be interfered with. So for temporary applications, they're only good for a year. You come in and if, you, for instance, if you're on the Price River, you come in and say, hey, we're doing a construction project up by Schofield and we need water. Can we file a temporary change application? If you're up in that area and, and you're filing water, a, a change application on a share of water and Price River Water Use Association will say, yeah, that happens all the time. We don't need to advertise that. We're already familiar enough with the conditions on the ground that we can make that decision and go ahead and, and act on the temporary change application. So we look at uh, just internally, if we believe there's, that it will impair if it, anybody that's out there existing. If it's not going to impair, we just go ahead and act on it and, uh, and approve it. For permanent change applications, the change does not impair an existing right without just compensation or adequate mitigation. So let's say you come in you have filed your change application, your neighbor is going to be impaired. And you know that. You know that by doing this, you're going to impair your, the next downstream water user. 
but you've already went and talked to him, you've worked out an agreement, he's in agreement with you, you've found some way to mitigate what you're doing, and he's okay with that. So in those instances, if you as a, an applicant can show that there's adequate mitigation or just compensa compensation for the change that you're seeking, that fulfills the criteria and we can move forward with the application and approve it. So just because you may impair somebody doesn't necessarily mean we're going to automatically reject the application. If you can come in and, and find some way to mitigate that impairment, you may still have a chance to get that application approved. Section 73.335, this is an addition to the code that was made in 2015, says that it will not cause a specific right to experience quantity impairment. So the legislature came in and defined what quantity impairment is. Quantity impairment is the diminishing of the quantity of water, a change in the timing or of, a, of, a, of availability of water, or enlarging the quantity of water depleted by the proposed nature of use. So the legislature has come in and set these three cr criteria and defined what quantity impairment is. So if we go back, you've come in, you've filed your change application, is there going to be quantity impairment experienced by another water user by the change that you're proposing? And again, we're going to look at, is there going to be a diminishing of the quantity of water available to the next downstream water user? We're going to look at specifically, is what you're doing going to change the timing of the avail availability of the water to the next guy downstream? or the next guy in priority? Or is what you're doing going to enlarge the quantity of water depleted by the proposed nature of use? So you're going to change your nature of use. You're going to change from this use, which has a certain diversion in the depletion, to this use, which has a different diversion and depletion. Maybe it's more consumptive. Maybe you're going from agriculture, which is 50% consumptive, about half the water you divert is going to be depleted, to power production that's 100% consumptive. We're going to look at those and as part of the criteria is whether or not we can approve the application. Quantity impairment does not mean a decrease in the static level of water in an underground basin or aquifer. If the volume of water necessary to satisfy an existing right otherwise rema remains reasonably available. So this specific criteria defined in statute by the legislature does not apply to groundwater basins if there remains enough water that's reasonably available to satisfy the existing rights. So quantity impairment is dealing mainly with surface flows, surface sources. 7335B says the applicant has the burden of rebutting the presumption of quantity impairment. This gets into a little bit of a more advanced topic. John Mann's going to cover this tomorrow. Uh, in water rights, we deal with the topic of forfeiture. If a water right is not used for a period of seven years, it's in jeopardy of forfeiture. That forfeiture doesn't actually happen unless there's some type of judicial court action on it. Either a general adjudication or another water user takes you to court and the court rules that your water right indeed has, has been forfeited because it hasn't been used. 
in this part of the co code, it says for a period of at least seven years, um, the water right has not been diverted for, for, from the approved point of diversion nor beneficially used at the approved place of use. These issues cannot be raised unless they are raised in a timely protest, identifying the rights that may be impaired, or a written notice from the state engineer is issued within 90 days from the filing of the application and identifying the rights that may be impaired. So if you have an application that falls into this um, boat where it hasn't been used for quite some time, and you come in and file a change application with us, part of our job is to give a written notice to anybody who might be impaired. So for instance, going back to the Price River, if you're on the Price River and you're up in the Schofield area and you have a water right that hasn't been used since the 1950s, and you come in and want to file a change application with us, um, we have an obligation by statute now to notify water users in that drainage that a change has been filed that may impair them with this water right coming back into the system. Okay, let's stop right there for just a second. Is there any questions on, on this part of it? We're going to move on to exchange applications. Yeah. Uh, who's the forfeit to? State of Utah or whoever brings suit against it? Okay, good question. The question is, if a water right is forfeited, who is it forfeited to? So if you own a water right and somebody, either we do a general adjudication on it or your neighbor takes you to court and the court actually issues a, a decree saying, yep, this water right's gone, it's forfeited. Nobody specifically gets that right. The flow in the drainage becomes available to the next water right user in priority. Does that make sense? What if it's been, they haven't used it for seven years, but then they start using it again? Is there a period of time they have to use the water again to reestablish that? So the question was, if somebody has not been using the water for longer than seven years and they start using the water again, is there a period of time that then they would be safe from forfeiture assertion. Yes, and that, that, that time is 15 years. So legally you can come back in, you can start putting your water back to use, and if you do that, and you do it continuously for 15 years, then that jeopardy of forfeiture goes away. Okay, so that's part of the approval criteria. Those are things we look at, we look at, you know, is there going to be interference with a new application or with a change application? Change applications generally are more difficult, they're more complex. You're making a change within an existing system. Who are you going to affect? Are you going to impair somebody? So as you're putting together applications, those are the things you want to look at. Those are the things you want to consider. Again, if you are going to impair somebody, it doesn't necessarily mean the application is going to be flatly rejected. Is there a way to mitigate it? Is there a way to find some solution to that impairment that will work? But then you've got to convince us that's gonna, that it's going to work. So, yeah? I, I'm, I'm a bit confused about this 7 and 15. If someone hasn't used it for seven years and they're facing a forfeiture and then they begin to use it, and if they use it for 15 years, it stays that way? Or if they've been using it for six years, and use it for five, and then don't use it for six more, then where So the question was about forfeiture again, and well, I'm not... Is it necessary for 15 years? Is that because it's been forfeited at some point, and it's been asked to be reinstated, and you have to use it for 15? Or so the question is a little bit more clarification on the seven years and 15 years. So if you have a water eye and you're using it, and even if you only use it one out of six years, well, you're okay. okay that's probably enough. That's all I need. But if seven consecutive years go by and you haven't used that water right at all. And someone has made notice of that and is trying to 
rescinded somehow. Right. Or even if you've only used part of your water right, the part of the right that has not been used for seven consecutive, longer than seven second consecutive years is in jeopardy of forfeiture. It doesn't get forfeited unless there's a, an actual court case, either through a general adjudication or somebody takes you to court and the court decrees, yep, it's gone, it's forfeited. And then if you use it, but it, it, if that doesn't happen, then you use it for 15 more years, then it's all Right, right. If you have a water right that hasn't been used for longer than seven years for whatever reason, and you come back in and start using it again, somebody could then take you to court and try to get it forfeited, but if if nobody notices or nobody cares and you continue to use it for 15 additional years, that jeopardy goes away. They can't, they can't take you to court again. During Good question. Years, someone could. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So if you drop the ball 14 years and nine months, you That's right. <laughs> so do you see water right Yes, there are other ways to protect a water right if you know you're not going to use it. If you've been diligently using your water right and you know that, hey, there's, there's 10 years here that I'm not going to use it. For instance, maybe you have a mine and you know that you know, our mine's in trouble. We're going to have 10 years before we can get back in production. You can file a, what's called a non-use application and that non-use application allows you to put the water out of use, but protects it from any type of forfeiture. Yes. Okay. Exchange applications. There's a couple of criteria specific to ex exchange applications. Um, as was mentioned, exchange applications typically deal with storage, uh, we don't do a lot of these in our area. You know, they do a lot in the Weber Basin. Some of the criteria specific to exchange applications are the original water in such stream body of water or reservoir must not be deteriorated in quality or diminished in quantity. And then also there has to be a legal interest in the underlying water right used as the basis for the exchange and usually that's a legal contract uh, with, the, with whoever it is you're doing the exchange with. Okay, another thing that we look at is, is the proposed plan physically and economically feasible? Unless the application is filed by the Bureau of Reclamation, then I guess it doesn't have to be feasible. <laughs> We have some of those. <laughs> and would not prove detrimental to the public welfare. So we're going to look. You've got a proposal in front of us. You've got an application in front, of, in front of us. Is what you're proposing physically and economically feasible? Can you do this? Is this project uh, reasonable? Or are you you know, on a wing and a prayer. Is this something that's, that's really not um, realistic? We also look at whether or not the application would prove detrimental to the public welfare. There's not a whole lot of other statutory guidance other than what you see right there. So the state engineer has to use reason and judgment as what does that mean? What does it mean detrimental to the public welfare. We'll listen to the arguments, we'll use good judgment, and try to figure out uh, the answer to that question. Let's talk a little bit more about physically and eco eco economically feasible. When you come in with your application, we don't need final design. We don't need to know all of the details. Again, you don't need to provide clear and convincing evidence. 
You don't need to provide overwhelming evidence beyond a shadow of a doubt. You just need to have a reasonable plan. Your project doesn't have to be in final design. Just give us the basic elements. It does not require the applicants to prove their entire project will be economically feasible by expending all of the required monies at this stage of the, of the process. Merely a reasonable probability, probability that the project can be built. So you don't have to go out and build your diversion structures. You don't have to go out and build your processing plant, your dairy, your power plant at this stage in the process. And just say, yes, we are working towards it. We have a plan. We're expending money towards the end of that plan and show a reasonable amount of evidence that what you've got going is a legitimate enterprise. Also, you have to show that you have the financial ability to complete the proposed works. You don't have to have all the money in your pocket, but you have to have a, some idea how you, financially you're going to make this work. Now, if you're just looking at a small application for a home, that's pretty low burden. You can come in and say, yeah, we're building a home down in Moab and we need a water right for a well. We're going to say, oh, it's pretty reasonable. People do that all the time. Fairly low burden. If you come in and, and say, we're building a nuclear power plant on the Green River, we're going to expect a little bit more detail. So we can actually come in and ask for additional financial information. We can come back in and say, all right, you've got this plan in front of us. You've got this application that you want approved. Um, it's going to cost a lot of money. What you're proposing, show us your articles of incorporation. Show us, we can ask for the names and places of res residents of your directors and officers and the amount of authorized and paid up capital. We've done this before. We've actually had applications in our office in price that appeared to be fairly speculative. And so we've come back and asked for this type of financial information and the applicants weren't able to provide it. And so the application was rejected. So you have to have at least some idea that of the resources you're going to uh, be able to access and use to, get, to complete your application and project. Okay, so it shall be du the duty of the state engineer to approve an application if the application was filed in good faith and not for the purposes of speculation and monopoly. Let's look a little bit closer as what that might mean. There was a decision in 2008 where the court uh, concluded that the state engineer concluded that the original ap application was filed for speculation or monop monopoly because the only proposed beneficial use for the water was a plan to sell it to others. Indeed, the applicants had no lands, facilities, customers, or contracts. So if you come in with an idea that you're going to acquire a water right just simply to have a water right to sell to somebody else, um, that could be speculative. We're going to look at that. Is this um, a real project? Are you really interested in appropriating water for some beneficial use? Or are you just trying to find a scheme to make some money? So we, we look at that. Another criteria? Do have a question yeah. St. George? Yes. How do you document or show usage during the seven year period and the 15 year period? So we have a question from St. George, and we're going to go back to this topic about forfeiture again. And the question is how do you document or show usage during the 15 year period? Okay, so with it, the question was during the seven or 15 year period, with any water right, keep records. Sometimes we'll have stream commissioners that are keeping official records for the state engineer. So if you're on Huntington Creek, we have a river commissioner. 
and he's keeping records of the diversions that are being made. But on some of our streams, we don't have river commissioners. And if you're interested in protecting your rights, keep records. Keep records of what you're diverting. Um, take pictures. So all of that documentation is worth its weight in gold if you're ever challenged. Um, keep a logbook. Note the date, time, amount of diversion. Snap a photo. And you compile a document record of what you're diverting. That's the safest way. Kent, do you want to add anything to that? Mark, I'd only say to, to as part of that record, which is a great thing to do, you, you'd want to have some documentation of how you're actually beneficially using that water. So if you put it on acres, make a note of how many acres you're putting on, or if you're watering stock, make a note of what you're using that water for, because beneficial use then becomes the the basis, the measure, and the limit of the rights to use water in the state, and so you want to you want to document that you've got that use going and what you're using it for. So, absolutely, yeah. If you're just diverting it out of the river and diverting it right back in, you're not making beneficial use of it necessarily. So, go out and take a picture of your hayfield. Keep track of the number of acres you're irrigating. Uh, all of that can be used as evidence to show that the, the water that you're using is being put to beneficial use and you're protecting your right. Okay, good question. All right. So we're going to look at whether or not the applicant, the application complies with the groundwater management plan. If you happen to be in an area where there's an established groundwater management plan and you want to file a new application or a change application, does your application comply with what is established in the groundwater management plan? If there's a groundwater management plan, it's probably not an area open to new appropriations. And there are specific things that may be required for change applications in that area. Okay, we're on to 73381B. If the state engineer has reason to believe that an application will interfere with the water's more beneficial use, the second time that's mentioned in the statute, for irrigation, in 2015, they added municipal in and industrial, domestic or culinary, stock watering, power or mining development or manufacturing, or will unreasonably affect public recreation or the natural stream environment or will prove detrimental to the public we welfare, mentioned again, the state engineer shall withhold approval or rejection of the application until the state engineer has investigated the matter. So here we have a couple more criteria coming in that we have to look at. Is what you're going to do going to affect public recreation? Is there some, you know, maybe you're on the Green River or the Colorado River and you have an idea that you want to appropriate a certain amount of water. We know that there's recreation that takes place on those water bodies. How are you going to affect it? How are you going to affect the rafting industry? Maybe you're on a stretch of stream that has some other particular type of recreation with it. Uh, we'll look at that. We'll look at that as one of the criteria that we have to investigate to determine whether or not we can approve an application in that area. We also look at natural stream environment. Is what you're going to, going to do going to have an effect on the natural stream environment? What is that effect? How's it, how's it going to affect perhaps endangered fish in the Green River? And we've developed some specific policies to that end. Um, do we do take environmental considerations into account. If you have an application and you know that you're in an area with some sensitive or endangered species, um, how are you going to deal with that? What's your application going to do to that environment if it's approved? And we need to know the answers to those questions. And again, is it going to prove detrimental to the public welfare? a very broad category with not a lot of specific instruction in statute as to what that means, make your argument and, and we'll consider and use reasonable judgment 
as to whether or not that's something that can be approved. Public recreation, natural stream environment. So that we, we've talked about some of this. Are there recreational opportunities on the water body? Are there riparian areas? Are there, is there wildlife concerns? Are there endangered species, animal or plant? Is there public health issues or infrastructure issues? Or are, are there large tax funded water projects that may be impacted by your application? All of these things are things that we're going to look at during the process of evaluating an application as whether or not we can take, take action on it to approve it. Okay, let's take a little bit of a sidebar and talk about hearings. Those are, what we just ran you through was the criteria for approval, the statutory uh, criteria for approval of an application. Each one of those items the state engineer has to consider. You've submitted your application, somebody has protested it, and if you if the protester has a good attorney, <laughs> he's going to protest it on every single one of those points. He's going to come in and say, there's no water available for appropriation. Or it's economically not feasible to do this. Or you're going to affect the natural stream environment. And they're going to throw up a protest. If that happens, we're going to call an informal hearing, generally. Um, so you get your application advertised and it's been protested. Sometimes even it, when an application has not been protested, we may want to hold a hearing. You're doing something that we know very little about and we need some additional information. Or just the very nature of your application is, is complicated or it's a large application. And even if nobody's protested, we may still drag you in and say, tell us more about this application, because we need to know and evaluate all of this criteria against your application to know whether or not we can approve it. So take some time, come in, and explain this to us. If it has been protested, the protestants will have an opportunity to come in and, and make their arguments, and you can make your arguments as to whether or not the application can be approved. The purpose of hearings is to gather additional information and data relative and pertinent to the applications before the state engineer. It may be held if there's been a timely protest filed. It may be held at the discretion of the division even, a pro even if a protest has not been filed. These are informal proceedings. You don't need an attorney. It's not a court action. It's an administrative decision. So you don't have to be representative by legal counsel. A lot of times, applicants and protestants will be represented by legal counsel to make their arguments. But it's not a requirement. If you can come in and make your argument, um, you can do it. If you want your legal counsel to come in and make your argument for you, that's permissible too. Again, notice that we may hold hearings. If an application comes in and we've been over this in the same area, same type of application, same type of protests, we may not hold a hearing. We may just waive the hearing and say, we already know all about this. We, we've been through this. Many times with this particular area and this particular item, we, we're good. We're just going to move forward and, and take action on the, on the application. So it's not necessarily a requirement that we hold the hearing, uh, but it gives us the opportunity to hold it if we need to gather that additional data. Administrative hearings are governed by Rule 655-6. They're open to all parties. They're there to introduce evidence, examine and cross-examine witnesses, make arguments, and fully participate 
in the proceeding. This is where it gets a little bit complicated. A party is a person commencing an adjudicative proceeding. Now, this is important. All respondents, all protestants, all persons permitted to intervene, all persons authorized by statute or agency rule to participate as party, as parties. We can have non-party participation. So a person acting as a witness for a party or participating as, the part, as part of the division's investigative and fact-finding powers. Such a party is, uh, such a person is not a party to the proceeding and may not seek judicial review. So you have to be a party to the proceeding in order to seek judicial review of, of the decision. We're going to talk a little bit more detail of this. So if you have a, an application that is submitted to us and somebody is concerned about your application and they submit a letter of concern, but they indicate clearly that this is not a protest. We're not protesting it. We don't want a hearing. We're just submitting a letter of concern. They may not be considered a party to the proceedings. They have to have intent. They have to have intent to commence an adjudicative proceeding. So they have to submit a protest if they want to be a party to it. If you just submit a letter of concern, don't pay a protest fee, don't consider it a protest, you may not be considered a party to the proceedings. If you're not a party to the proceedings, you don't have the right to seek judicial review. So witnesses, you, you might bring a witness in, uh, maybe an engineering geologist, and he may provide, or hydro, hydrogeologist, and he may provide testimony on behalf of your application. Um, he wouldn't be considered a party, he's just an expert witness that you've brought in. Okay, this was an, a court case that was actually settled this year and I don't know if settled is the right word because there's still some issues around, revolving around it. But in this, in this case, it said the court said, therefore, although ap ap applicants are, excuse me there, are aggrieved, ap appellants, thank you, are aggrieved persons, they lack standing because only persons that are both aggrieved and qualify as parties Aggrieved parties have standing under Section 73.314 and UAPA to contest a decision of the state engineer. I won't get into the details of this particular case, but just understand that there is a difference between being an aggrieved person and being an aggrieved party. You may take issue with somebody's application and you may be an aggrieved person, but unless you actually get in and file a protest and begin an adjudicative proceeding by doing one of those things, then you're not a party to the, uh, to the process. So that's important. Okay, administrative he hearings. Now, before I go on, is there any questions about what we just covered on the difference between aggrieved parties and aggrieved persons? Because if you have a question, I'm going to turn it over to Kent. <laughs> but that is a, an important distinction. If you're filing an application or you're protesting an application, you have to understand that distinction. So, administrative hearings, the purpose is to gather additional information, data, evidence relative and pertinent to the application. On what? What are we looking for in a hearing? Well, we're looking for information on whether or not there's unappropriated water in the proposed source. 
whether or not it's going to impair existing rights or interfere with the more beneficial use of water, whether or not it's phys physically, physically and economically feasible, whether or not you have the financial ability to complete the proposed works, whether or not this application is being filed in good faith, not for purposes of speculation or monopoly, uh, whether or not your application is going to unreasonably affect public recreation or the natural stream environment. So your application may actually inf affect the natural stream environment, but is the effect going to be reasonable? You know, are you talking about uh, a small impact to the environment or are you going to dry dam the whole stream and take it somewhere else? Okay. And whether or not the application complies with the groundwater management plan. If you have met all of those criteria, it's the duty of the state engineer to approve that application. If, you, if the application does not meet the requirements of this section, then it is rejected. It shall be rejected. Now, we have five minutes left. So you think you're through the end of the process. <laughs> well, that's not quite true. <laughs> we have statutory criteria, and that's the criteria we just went through. We have a number of other things that we have to take into consideration. We have policies in all of our specific areas that are pertinent to specific things in those areas. So not only the statutory criteria outlined in what we just went through, 7338, but we're, we're actually going to look at specific policies in the area that you want to appropriate. So for instance, if you're down in the town of Castle Valley, which is the little area in the map, that's in area 05 in our region. There are specific policies that pertain to water right appropriation within the town of Castle Valley. So we're going to look at those specific division policies in regards to what has been developed in that particular spot over the last 100, I don't know, 110 years or so. In Grand County, okay. up the river from Moab. And we have a lot of site-specific policies. In our area, we have a site-specific policy for the town of Casa Valley. We have a site, or we have a specific policy for the Colorado River Basin. We have some in, endangered fish policies. We have policies for the upper watershed of the price, as we mentioned. We have a policy for Argyle Canyon. We have a policy for Mill Creek, upper watershed. We have a policy for Willow Basin, watershed. So all of these are specific policies that have been developed based on <laughs> things that have happened in that particular drainage through the years. So if you're looking at appropriating water in Willow Basin, there's a specific policy that governs that. And we're going to look at the, this, the, the items in that policy as we consider your application. Finally, there's a whole bunch of other considerations that we look at. For instance, as we mentioned, there's diversion and depletion. Is your change application going to change the diversion and depletion balance on your application or within the drainage. If you're changing from a surface source to a groundwater source, and the surface source is only there half a year, maybe the, the, you're up, up high in elevation and the stream flows from April till July. But after July, there's no flow in the stream. 
but now you want to move the water to an underground well where there's water all the time. We're going to consider that. We're going to look at, okay, your surface source only provided water for three months. How much was that? How much water was that? And we're going to use that in considering how much water can be changed to this underground well. Okay, that's one of the considerations we have. It's not necessarily one of the statutory, statutory criteria, but we're going to use that because um, maybe it does apply in some ways to the statutory criteria. Maybe it's keeping things in balance so we're not impairing other water users in the, in the area. We'd require well abandonment. If you're moving from this well over here to this well over here, we're going to consider, okay, there has to be some abandonment of that old well if there's no water right on it. If you're doing a change on shares in, in an irrigation company, um, there's criteria that you have to maintain those shares. If you purchase a share and move it to Schofield for your cabin, you can't turn around and then sell the share. You got to keep the share so it pertains to that water being used at your cabin. Um, if you're taking and moving water from this field over here to this field over here, you've got to give up the use of this field. You can't use them both. <laughs> you've got to retire that prior use. If there are issues with where you want to appropriate, for instance, maybe you want to appropriate from a well that's on BLM ground. There might be access issues. Maybe the BLM's not going to give you access to that. Those are things that we're going to need to consider. And then also there's a whole host of municipal right considerations that deal with cities specifically and municipalities and public water suppliers. All of those things, the statutory criteria, the policy, the site specific things, and everything that we just talked about plays into approvals of water right applications. So that's what we run through. It looks like we're ending just on time. Do we have any other questions? Do you ever have occasion when the statutory regulation interferes with the policies, say, of the particular basin where they're in conflict with each other? Does one supersede the other? Generally not, because generally site-specific policies have come out of statutory considerations. Okay. Well, you all have a little bit of knowledge. We just made you in enough information to make you dangerous. So we'll go ahead and break for lunch. Thank you.